There's some days when scans after scans are just bad news. It's actually the patient that provides me that strength. We're so fortunate to be in this position. Yes, there are relatively down days, but at the same time, when you talk about the immunotherapy era, where in stage four, looking at the first scan and you don't know how this person is going to respond, and now they're walking and attending their granddaughter's wedding, complete response. Welcome to Target Cancer Podcast. My name is Dr. Sanjay Janeja. I'm a hematologist, medical oncologist, also known as the Onc Doc on social media. And today I have two people that are even cooler than the Onc Doc because they're the Onc brothers. And as soon as I found out about them, I was like just down a deep hole on learning everything and, and kind of sharing, feeling this vibe. And, and I have both of you here and I couldn't even, I already feel like I know you. So I'm very excited to have you both. Before I let them introduce themselves, basically, they are doing what is very much needed in this country, right? We, people in the community, community oncology is different than hospital and academic um, and, you know, sometimes these major elite cancer centers as far as what the cancer care is. In community oncology, a lot of times you don't have a GI oncologist and a pulmonary oncologist and, and a colorectal and every kind of specialist. And there's a kind of growing gap between the delivery of care of everyday Americans, you know, the ones that we all take care of, and everything we're finding out in like rapid fire ho hose kind of, you know, speed. So with all that said, and, and without much ado, I'm so excited to have you both. The first thing I want to ask is, how did you get here? What is it that drives you? And maybe a little bit of a backstory on, on the amazing things that you both are doing. Yeah, first off, thank you so much. This is very exciting. Uh, I said this even before we started recording, coming all this from someone who's such a big social media influencer and doing what you're doing for all the patients, this means a lot. So thank you for having us. Well, we are very humbled, uh, Sanjay, to actually have us be part of such a winter. Thank you so much again. What you're doing is phenomenal, and we are just like trying to store up something like that on Twitter, where uh, we are trying to stem out this knowledge and disseminate very much required information for patients and all the community oncologists and medical professionals who are tied up with oncology. So, no, thank you so much for doing what you're doing uh, on Instagram, uh, TikTok, and everywhere. And um, we're just trying to stem out that on. Well, I'm about to put both of you on there, you know, very soon. I'll be, I'll be texting you to ask for like little pieces of, of say this and then we can tie this all together. So, so if y'all don't mind sharing your background, I'm very familiar with it, but just so people know kind of exactly what your world looks like. And then maybe the, you know, to start, what is it that, uh, how did you, how did you kind of see the need? Was there one story that really said, Hey, we need to speak more about this. Or was it just kind of, did y'all, you know, convene on a Saturday night, you know, drinking and said, you know, we need to do something here. How did that happen? Yeah, so I'll start. Hello, everyone. I am Rahul Gosain, and I am a practicing general medical oncologist in suburbs of Rochester, New York, with the University of Rochester Wilmot Cancer Institute. Sanjay, I'm sure you would know this feeling. Now, for me, almost five years ago, when I started as an attending, right after my fellowship, I was at my first job, and I was the only oncologist at site. As a new attending, I was second guessing myself and would drive back. It was an hour and a half commute one way. And I would be thinking what I did in my clinic all day long. I would be texting, calling, emailing all my mentors to make sure that what I did was right. And more importantly, that no one out there would do a better job for these patients, right? And we all know that most of our patients are still getting treated by general medical oncologists or in community today. And just in the last two to three years, we've seen so many approvals, we've seen so many new indications. So to keep up with that, I felt that there is a big need. A year later, Roy had started, uh, he finished his fellowship and he was going through the same thing. And we would chit chat throughout our drive. He was commuting for an hour, an hour, 15 minutes, one way as well and that we decided that there's a bigger need. It just can't be Rohit and I who are struggling with this. Um, so we went to social media. We were very late to this game. By this time, everyone was planning to come off Twitter uh, for several reasons. But once we started, there are these communities either for Met Twitter, on Twitter, and we just asked, started asking questions that we would struggle with day in, day out. There were simple questions to someone who's in academics, and a lot of the conversation at that time was focused towards phase one, phase two, where is this field headed, rather than focusing on what standard of care and how can we do better 
on that in the community. So that's how it started, got some traction, and thankfully it continues to help other community oncologists. Love that. Rohit, similar story, right? Yeah, so I'm Rohit Gosain. I'm out in community as well um, at UPMC Hillman Cancer Center in a suburb of upstate New York, Jamestown, New York, and it's a, a hospital, UPMC Chautauqua Hospital. Now, again, it has been a very selfish purpose for us to launch the Twitter handle because it was for us to keep up to date with everything, which is changing by the minute. And little did we know that uh, it wasn't just us, as Raul stated, who were just struggling with all this. I still remember when I started, I used to, that one and a half hour commute, I used to wrap up with my wife in about five minutes and I used to jump on a call with Rahul, both our drives being one and a half hour, spending one hour, 25 minutes of that commute time, just talking about patients and what is changing in oncology. And it was just like such a struggle. And despite having so many newsletters, everyone is still struggling because there's so much out there, but no one is again, as Rahul stated, not talking about practice changing. Everyone is talking about phase one, phase two. How can we change things 10 years down the road while how are things changing for tomorrow patient care? Well, that was missing even from ASCO, all these conferences a lot of that gets missed out. How are we going to treat our patients tomorrow? So that's what the main focus was. And um, when we did launch it, we didn't really realize that there was a following for that. But little did we know, and it spanned off from there. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy that you have to, you would, you know, somebody says, oh, wait, doctors are using social media. There was this whole kind of thing two or three years ago. And it's like, it, you know, the fact that it's social media, that's not one umbrella, right? There's just so many kind of avenues. And, and for those that don't know, especially Twitter, I need a, I need a 101 from one of you at some point with Twitter, because I actually don't know how that space works yet. And my wife would actually love that. So she's an oncologist and she's on what's called physician mom group. So that's a very big Facebook group where she's been, that she's been using for, gosh, probably like five to seven years now for the exact same purpose where you have like the physician mom group, which is general, you know, doctors. So they all ask kind of random questions about kids, especially since we're all adult and my wife and I leave and we don't know anything about children. And then there's the, like a hemon subgroup. But then now Twitter does that and everything as well. It's for these cases. So I call it, they call it practicing. It sounds corny, but, but it's there's not always the right answer. So that's a lot of medicine. But then in oncology, it's like, wait, that answer that was the answer seven to 10 days ago actually may not be the answer anymore. Like, and it's a very, very real reality, redundancy, you know, intended because it's a great problem to have. It's just so, 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 so explosively fast. But um, I think, you know, that brings us to one point, which is like, I always encourage, like, I, I respect like this kind of need of, you know, second opinion. And do I, do I go somewhere else to like, you know, see, to make sure the treatment regimen is, is kind of similar. So just so patients know, when we talk about standard of care, what we mean is what do the guidelines say is, is basically the right thing to do, right? So about, let's just say four or five years ago, when something, NCCN, so I, we haven't actually talked about these things on my podcast before, but NCCN are like National Cancer Network guidelines that we all kind of follow at the minimum as a standard is the hope. And they have different categories. So if you have a cancer diagnosis and you're listening to this, you want to look up and see, is this, and you want to ask the question, is it the current NCCN category one preferred? And not all of them have a preferred, but if they have a preferred, then it's usually one or two regimens and you know you're in good hands. But the problem is, and that's what I usually tell my patients, I'm like, if you want peace of mind, go for it. If you want a trial, definitely second opinion. But the most common questions you want to ask your oncologist when you go in is, number one, like, this first line treatment, like, does NCCN re recommend considering a clinical trial up front, right? Like, for so kidney cancer, for the longest time, they were like, you know, consider a clinical trial even in the first line. The reason being, number two, the question is, what is the likelihood of success, like in that treatment arm? So there are some things that are 85% effective, right? If you have a molecular target like EGFR for stage four lung cancer, which everyone should get sequenced at least as an adenocarcinoma, but, but you know, very strongly considered for squamous and all these other things, and we have immune therapies, then you ask, what is the likelihood of success? And when you ask those two questions, then, then at least you have the peace of mind of knowing what you're getting. But the, that's why not many, nobody's asked actually how this podcast happened and X Cures, which is uh, kind of supporting the educational outreach. That's, I found X Cures rather than Twitter when it came to getting that kind of like background insight. So X Cures is, is an AI model, it's not an AI doctor, but at least it's, it, it sequences. It uses algorithms to quickly at least tell you like all the things based on the stuff you populate at that moment 
what are the, the standard of care and CCN recommended, you know, options. And then it tells you a couple of trials that are, you know, can be accessed. And, and it's these kind of tools, these adjuncts, that basically I think is going to make us make it even doable to be a medical oncologist. You need all the support you, you can get. There are platforms where you can asynchronously, asynchronously uh, consult like a specialist specialist, right, an academic center. And then you have like an AI platform that will give you the cancer journey and kind of at least everything to test. So I'm getting long-winded, but there's a whole bunch of um, need for things to be implemented. And do you think there's a resistance to getting those tools on board? Is it more of a money thing? What do you all think is the reason? We know the technology is insane, but Mo for the most part, medical oncologists rely on their brain. There's not an automated system. They're trying with flat iron and these things to tell you what to do. But why do you think that is, that, that, that these additional tools aren't incorporated you know, quite as quickly? Yeah, so I think a few things to reiterate. NCCN guidelines, I think they're guidelines. They're not right. rules. Uh, so a lot of that leaves gray area saying how you would treat versus I would treat. Again, referring back to NCCN guidelines, the thought ends up being we'll all pick the same first line. But after first, second, third line, there's a lot of room to interpret how you're going to choose that. And I think that's where social media or Twitter plays a big role. In academics, a lot of our oncologists focus on one or the other disease site, like you said. So Twitter gives us a chance to have those discussions, learn from it, saying it's not just a poll, but that back and forth on Twitter is so healthy uh, that you walk away saying, all right, I think I'm better prepared to have that conversation with my patients. And the other thing on Twitter ends up being it's an open democratic platform where you have everyone pitching in from radon to surgeon to medon to patients to patients advocate to caregivers. So I really think it's such an, such a healthy back and forth. Coming back to you, uh, Sanjay, what you brought up, what's the resistance? You know, unfortunately, right now, there's some systems that don't even have EMR. You know, we're in the world where we're talking about AI or we're in the world where we're talking about autopilot for cars. I can't even access records mm -hmm across the street if they're not on the same EMR and I'm still struggling to get the facts. And that's a bottleneck, right? It's a bottleneck on patient care. I'm still waiting for the pathology molecular sequencing. I'm still waiting for the report or the specialist visit from last week. I do that every day. And that's what you don't see in the, in the background. You're going to a room, you're like, what did the surgeon say? Like, I need to know what they said, right? I mean, it's, that's crazy. That's a very good point you bring. So actually, this is not, none of this podcast is a pitch for x but they just, they just incorporated the health information exchange where they can pull anyone that's on the health information exchange and put it on an accessible EMR, which is like basically you log in. And so if you show up in some random ER or some random clinic, you log in, you can say, this is my entire treatment history. Here are my last labs and everything else. So that's, you know, that's, that's a pretty, uh, pretty neat thing that hopefully is going to start trickling, trickling in. But you nailed it with the second and third line. That's where you really, that's where I always offer trials because that same series of questions, you know, likelihood of success, a small cell lung cancer, right? When you progress on platinum therapy, none of us like that situation because nothing, everything has a 20 to 30% chance of working. Like, what do you do? And that's when you start getting into all these fancy little mutations that aren't necessarily at all standard, but an expert knows, you know, maybe, hey, this seems to work better in this tumor type. So it's, it's uh, I'm very glad you brought up that point. That is the kind of judgment call and experience call that people are looking for. So I'd just like to add one thing, Sanjay. Yes, we are talking about the first line being an easier option where a community oncologist or any oncologist should be able to sort of talk to the patient and their family about. But unfortunately, even on that setting, we are still lacking a lot of involvement from the community oncologist or oncologist in general because about 50% general medical oncologists are not checking for NGS testing, which is so sad, especially when you talk about lung adenocarcinoma, colon cancer, and melanoma for BRAF, and some of the basic stuff that we actually should be offering our patients, and those patients and their families are being lacked out of that tremendous survival data, which is so sad, which they find out when they go for a second opinion and talking to an academician and they were, they're were like, well, you didn't even get talked about this and you were get thrown chemotherapy. So it is sort of sad while we are struggling in first line and we are still trying to explore clinical trials out in second and third line, but these patients are being deprived of that option even in first line, which is very, very sad. And that's where I feel like social media, TikTok and uh, Instagram, all this gets out to the patient where sometimes when community oncologists are not 
tying the patient and their family with this information, patients should be able to ask the community oncologist or any oncologist, why am I not getting this targeted therapy? So there are a lot of education does involve the medical community, but again, the focus is, has to be on patient as well, which is, again, we are trying to do some part of it, but that is still lacking. Yeah, and I think that's a shift that I hope is becoming, even if it's begrudgingly, like it's becoming a focus. It's like, okay, the best insurance you have to make sure that someone's getting the right care is like, is to start to go more patient facing with education and empowerment, right? We have this kind of, I hate to say it, patriarchal or matriarchal way of oncology practice back in the day, which is, this is what I told you, there's no way you would question it. I hope anyone listening to this podcast, I really hope anyone feels comfortable going to their oncologist and asking more questions. Because if you don't, I would, I would hope that you have the op opportunity to maybe reconsider for a second opinion. Not be, that, that oncologist would be 10 times better than I am, don't get me wrong. But the peace of mind and the comfort is really invaluable because we're all finite. Like we all have a, a termination date, sadly. But that, that journey, that process, and as people are living with stage four cancer for years now, and before you know, couldn't say that 15 years ago, where your mental health is and your feelings about your care and everything is very important, number one. And number two, also being able to ask and have that conversation. Like, I tell them on day one, most of my new patients, I'm like, ask me anything. Like, I just want you to, like, I don't want something to be keeping you up at 3 a.m. every, you know, week or so uh, of bothering you. So I hope somebody's not getting anxious listening to this. What are some things that people can do, I guess, to, to you know, try to stay afloat when, you know, if a loved one or themselves are having kind of, care in a very, you know, it's not that community oncologists know less or are less smarter by any means. It's that just so people understand, they are responsible for everything. You cannot go to a colorectal, like, you know, it's focused oncologist. They're doing lung, colorectal, ovarian, uterine, glioblastoma, cholangiocarcinoma, melanoma. They're doing everything. Whereas a lot of institutions now, they have their departments where there's a specialist that does one or two different specialties. So, what do y'all suggest for like a community oncology patient or family to, to do to kind of, you know, I would say like extras is one option. There's many different, you know, platforms like that, but it's, they're free. They're how you're able to populate and get your own treatment options and kind of get an idea or headspace. But what do you think? I'm sure part of the answer is educate yourselves, right? Yeah. So I think it's also important. Why do we have this need of community oncologists? Why do we have a portion of subspecialists? Uh, whereas in rural settings, we're talking about general medical oncologists, because even right now, there's a huge lack of medical oncologists to serve the nation to begin with. So I, in rural settings where we have more general medical oncologists, each medical oncologist is serving a lot bigger in catchment area than what we tend to see in urban areas, right? So I would love to say that each community oncologist can just focus on one or two, but the sad reality is they're seeing everyone because that is what the need is there. Um, often what I tell my own patients ends up being, it is actually important for you to go on the internet and start looking, but the source is important. I don't want you to go down the rabbit hole of looking into forums or saying one of anecdotal experiences, but there's quite a few good resources NCI, um, then a lot of universities, Wilmot, uh, University of Rochester, Roswell, Mayo Clinic, MD Anderson, they actually put a lot of disease information on their site. So I find them very useful to direct our patients to that or caregivers to that. When it comes to community oncologists, um, again, I really, really think that a lot of CME conferences that are focused towards standard of care or what's practice changing ends up being important. When I was commuting, I was consuming anywhere between eight to 10 hours of CME a week just to keep up with that, right? So I really, really think exactly to what you said, the onus is on us. This is what we've decided to do. So it's my responsibility that I am staying up to date so that I can deliver the best care close to home yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah. So. And I feel like one thing uh, which patients do appreciate sometimes is just drawing things which are very simplistic format for these patients. This is the first line and just sort of easing out that anxiety as well, that what our second and third lines are going to entail and the things are a lot different. People are still worried about the era of chemotherapy 
where first thing they think about is nausea, vomiting, not able to eat anything, and hair loss. Things are a lot different, and patients are surviving even in stage four setting for years and years. So I think that information and education is extremely important. And the second important thing is, uh, as you brought up, Sanjay, is the second opinion. I feel like some patient, some oncologist will take it personally why patient is going down that route. However, I feel like patient is definitely going to get more educated with that. On top of that, I feel like I'm going to learn a thing or two which I'm missing for this patient, which I can apply for the second one. But at the end of the day, at least the patient will be at much of an ease and comfortable if they come back after that second opinion. So a lot of this is, again, a teamwork where patients should feel that you are being in their passenger seat while the patient is being in the driver's seat. So that helps out and pay, makes the patient and their family feel a lot at ease. For sure. Are there any resources that y'all recommend, you know, to anyone listening that can help? I mean, for example, I use leukemia lymphoma, not use, you know, uh, bring on board leukemia lymphoma society. A lot of my patients, especially my younger kind of pediatric adult patients that have uh, potentially like, you know, what's called MPN, myeloproliferative neoplasm. So they have, they make too many platelets and anyone listening, you know, most of the time the platelets are up for other reasons, but if it's a primary reason, an MPN, then a lot of <clears throat> time these patients need transplants or, or, um, you know, leukemias and, and lymphomas, of course, but LLS is a great example where you get this like personal coordinator, they see where you live, they see what kind of like trials are out there. You know, I say it all the time, but anyone listening needs to remember that trials are not like what experiments were 30 years ago, right, with phase one. Like, phase one is like, okay, you, can humans survive taking this? Okay, that's phase one, like back then, right? And it's like, okay, now they can take it, this is the dose, does it work, it's phase two. Now, yes, we may have phase one, phase two, but they're so much more tailored. Like, instead of this kind of shotgun approach of like, okay, it's a poison, does it kill a human? It's like, okay, this human has this cell, and then inside the cell has this very, like, whittled down, like, molecular mutation, and it seems like it's an on switch, and we think we got something that can turn off that on switch so that that cell doesn't keep growing. Like, that might be the phase one. So, um, trials, all these silver bullet things that we're talking about where people live years, they came from trials. They came, like, from a theory that say, hey, this is the thing that seems to, like, grow, and a lot of times, trials will take something from a different tumor type. We're like, where to use this drug? in this other tumor time, hey, and it works really well, right? Immune therapy came out in lung cancer, and now it's like in, I don't know, 10, 12 different, you know, tumor types. That is also a trial, so I want people to know that as well. But LLS is a good one. Um, I use, there are some, uh, you know, patient advocacy groups. I always try to, like, uh, bring them towards a lot of nonprofits locally. Oh, patients, like, feel comfortable just regionally. You can even, even Google for support if you have trouble with transport and these kind of other things that can help. And, and I just always got to say it. But anyone, if, you know, if you're listening, please uh, consider, you know, your bone marrow registry. So that's way different than blood, right? Being a blood or organ donor is one thing, but a bone marrow, there are people every single day right now, children, parents, praying that somebody just goes to one of those bone marrow registry sites, swab their cheek, because they are on a thinning lifeline. They have control of their disease, right, or the leukemia or whatever they need to transplant for, and that time will expire, and all they need is the right person to sign up, and you will save someone's life literally, potentially, forever. What are some other resources that y'all recommend that could help kind of support patients maybe in the community? Yeah, so I think um, we're fortunate, both of us actually being associated with university settings. So even though we're both general medical oncologists, being affiliated with the university brings a lot of these resources. So I think that's important. Um, Coming back to actually what you said, two things. I think we need to do better in terms of clinical trials in the community as well. And the reason why I bring that up, anything what we have right now, that standard of care was part of a clinical trial once, right? That is how we got where we are. These were experimental medications. And now this is approved. So someone who got exposed to a clinical trial early on got exposed to a potential life-changing treatment early on. So I really think that in the community, we need to do a tad bit better. Uh, coming back to your, that our clinical trials are more focused now. We've seen this across solid tumors. There are so many agnostic approvals. We've seen that with BRAF. We've seen that with NTRAC. We've seen immunotherapy in almost every disease site, like you've pointed out. So I, again, really think that as community oncologists, we need to be more proactive. I very well understand and appreciate that we're doing a lot. So there are a lot more hurdles to cross to get our patients on board, but it is something that we should continue to look out for in the community. And then um, com coming back to the resources, I really think that 
a lot of societies, a lot of uh, patient advocate, a lot of nonprofit uh, organizations do a phenomenal job in connecting patients with other survivors, uh, giving them support. So I really think that makes a world of a difference. Right. The education aspect is certainly the key. Um, that information is, again, provided with uh, some of the university pamphlets that we have available, especially some of the treatment names that we even struggle with. So leave apart, the patient can pronounce those things. So ha handling uh, that over. But along with that, focusing, as Rahul mentioned, the clinical trials, I tend to tell these patients these are something that you can ha avail them today, which is going to be approved five years down the road. So, and now when these, these patients do uh, get tied up with these clinical trials, they get so much more support with such rigorous uh, lab checking and everything with the patient advocates, supportive management. So I think it is all around a very good plan. So, but again, patients uh, have to be informed about this, educated about this, so they can be tied up with appropriate tertiary care center and the appropriate care can be provided. That actually brings me to, a, to another point that I, I'm actually excited about, and that's, I've only started saying it in the last six months, and when a lot of times a patient comes in their family, they have very appropriately the question, how long do I have, right? A stage, stage four, generally speaking, if you're stage one to three, our hope is that we are like potentially curing you of your disease or having a durable remission. But if you are a true stage four, and even stage fours now, like, you know, head and necks, if it's an A, you can still go for curative. So stage four still means different things. Testicular, if it's spread into multiple organs, it's still a stage three, even though it's spread. So definitely ask, you know, your, your, your doctor about that. But, but if you're a, you know, unfortunate classic stage four with spots that are in multiple you know, places and it seems incurable, the thing that I can say today for about the last six months or 12 months is if we were to look at what the average survival is in this setting, that has to basically presume complete flat line of progress in oncology. And I'm like, and that is actually less realistic than, than, than to basically use a statistic that's looking backwards. And it's because of trials and all the things that have come out. So now when somebody's, you know, stage four, like average survival is 24, 28 months, I'm able to say that's if everything froze on our treatments today, but they continue to grow. And that is, you know, hope is such a big factor, but it's this in this particular setting, it's so important because I'm like, who knows? I'm like, let's focus on getting you the bucket of response. I want you to respond to first line. That's one of the biggest hurdles and we're high-fiving. Like, well, no, one, I just want you to tolerate the therapy after cycle one. And if you do, high-five. Two, are you a responder? High-five. And I'm like, and then let's just ride out and enjoy as much as we can because who knows on that average duration of six to eight to 12 months or 18 months that it works, what's also gonna happen? So that whole answer can change. So I just hope anyone can appreciate, you know, maybe back in the day people, you know, were too rigid and would say, well, I don't have a crystal ball. And I think that's a little, you know, there's a reason for the question. But now I do think it's almost potentially deceptive to give you a number based on retrospective or backwards data, knowing, just knowing what's come out in the last four years and how survivals have increased. I mean, it's been absolutely insane. So I hope anyone hearing this, you know, can appreciate that factor. But I'm going to ask you a difficult question, and, and we can have, a, uh, have one in between so you can think about it. But it's twofold. Since you've come out into oncology, right, so this it's generally like, you know, 10 years, there's med school, the residency, and fellowship. Number one, what is something that surprised you or is different from what you expected when you signed up for it? Because you're basically committed, my wife and I were committed, and we, we, we still very much uh, love and feel like it was, you know, a celestial calling for us to do oncology. But two, how is your philosophy, if at all, changed about like life and human experience or anything uh, as an oncologist. I think that's one thing we've never touched on here, but I do think we're very humbled and privileged to be in a position of seeing so much kind of more upfront potential, you know, death and terminality that at least for my wife and I, it's made us, it's humbled us in extraordinary ways because it's, it's when people say, it's so hard, how are you an oncologist? I'm like, it's not hard. It's actually very humbling. So who wants to feel that question if you're ready for it? <laughs> yeah, so I'll start. Um, <clears throat> I think a surprise being in this field has been there's some low days. There's some days when scans after scans are just bad news. And I am shocked to see that often in these situations, it's actually the patient that provides me that strength. Oh. And to me, it's mind boggling. Just when I'm having that conversation with them, like I'm just holding back my tears. I wanna make sure that, hey, let's talk about what's next. 
I, I really think that often patient would be like, hey, doc, we did everything. Let's make sure we focus on what's left. Mm -hmm. And to me, it is so humbling to exactly what you said, saying we're doing everything. We're so fortunate to be in this position. It just gave me goosebumps. I mean, I, I the exact same thing. It's, it's, it's humbling in the sense that you see this extraordinary strength in this person in front of you that may have been so quiet on day one visit, just like, you know, also insecure and they're vibrant and they're comforting. It's, it's, ah, you nailed it. I just got chills. It's funny because um, I can't agree more with Rahul, but at the same time, I feel like anyone outside of oncology, even my wife questions me, uh, where Rahul's wife is an uh, anesthesiologist, my wife is training to be a gastroenterologist, two separate fields, they're like, how do you do oncology? Is it depressing? And we get that question encountered by us, like floor nurses, other staff all the time. And I feel like that's exactly opposite of that. Yes, there are relatively down days, but at the same time, when you talk about the immunotherapy era, where in stage four, looking at the first scan and you don't know how this person is going to respond when you're talking about the performance that is extremely debilitated, ECOG two or three, and now they're walking and attending their granddaughter's wedding and whatnot with scans looking, NED, complete response. That is shivering on its own and seeing that patient do all the activities which they have never thought. And the weird part and the funny part about this is then arthritis and basic stuff takes a front seat while cancer is long forgotten. I say that multiple times in a day. I'm like, I was like, we'll start going down this rabbit hole about some secondary symptom. and like, but man, this is all privileged conversation. I'm like, you're stage four, like two years. Like, These are good problems to have, right? And then everyone, we're just like laughing yes. and, and you know, it's my tears of joy. It's like, that's so true is we can talk about something that's so normal person problem or problems because of the therapy that's out there. That is, that, that's giving me goosebumps as well. I love it. This is, this is a very unique podcast. I'm never able to talk about quite, you know, these kind of things. On a similar note, though, and this may be a little bit of a, uh, you know, we have to be careful what we're saying, but we already talked about how community oncologists, you know, have to work very hard to stay afloat with, with how unbelievably, insanely multifold some of the treatments and durations of treatments and survivals have become. Are you seeing a problem or a resistance on getting other providers on board that are non-oncology when that patient is either coming in with you know a lot of disease and we don't know what it is and the impression is kind of more what it was before targeted therapy well they're probably not going to live do we want to put them through a biopsy do we want to put them through treatment you know my reflex answer unless somebody is very close to death i'm like to not know what you're looking at is like is is saying like oh someone's 83 and they're in heart failure and needing oxygen should we give lasix or not <clears throat> i mean it's like you're going to give a diuretic to make them at least more comfortable to get the fluid off of their lungs, so even if they're 85 years old, if it's if it's an easily reversible process. And I'm not saying all cancers are, but some are extremely reversible with high probability, like a Lasix. How is that? How does that go? I mean, you know, and and it's a difficult conversation, right? Because sometimes you feel like you may be at at odds or, or trying to do this like valiant heroic thing and, and, and you're not and because you just know what, what, what potentially can be reversed. Yeah, I think uh, educating all the team members, primary care, ER, is the important part, right? We saw part of this when immunotherapy was relatively new. These patients would end up in the ED, they would have colitis and they would be treated for infectious causes but never receive steroids and these patients come to something potentially that was reversible. Right, so as we make these advances, I really think it's important to keep everyone in medicine up to date that, oh my God, we've made bounds and leaps of difference now for certain diseases, right? For colon cancer, the average stage four is more than two years. And someone who has EGFR mutation just up front, your treatment response is close to 18, 19 months with targeted agents. So I really think that keeping our primary care, our ER, and just the whole providing team informed is the way to go. And often they want to look out for this. They want to do the best for the patient. I think if anything, retro, uh, contrary to what you brought up, you had brought up how have things changed for us since I've been in this field? There was an article that anyone in medicine, actually, if they were going through cancer, often reaches out for palliative care sooner if it was their personal family member or if it was me. 
but we still continue to see some resistance in the field of medical oncologists of getting palliative care on board, where we've seen there's overall survival benefit if you get them on board sooner, there's better quality of life. So I think it's a two-way th thing where we have to keep our primary care physicians informed of there's a lot of interventions, but also us as medical oncologists saying we need to know when to stop and start appreciating other other team members like palliative care. Yes, very, that's a very good point. I mean, that, that you know, that's there is a survival benefit to bring palliative in. And anyone listening, I hope you understand, please know that palliative does not mean passive hands off necessarily. It is all of the adjunctive measures that can enhance your performance status, your appetite, make you the best version of you for either active anti-cancer treatment or like at a break or even with hands off of anti-cancer treatment. But you want to incorporate the palliative piece. You want to stay conditioned. You want to make sure your pain's treated, your, your you know, mental health, your psychology. All of these things can play a significant factor on what your course against your cancer looks like. Um, but, but to your point, and you know, I just hope, what worries me is, I hope everyone understands that's listening is if you have scans that look bad, but you don't know what it is, right? You don't know what it is. I would, I would, you know, I would strongly encourage to at least know what it is, right? Like, so melanoma, yes. I mean, melanoma is, it can look really bad. But it has extraordinary brisk responses, 40 to 50 percent, 40 percent of the time to immune therapy, to non-chemo. So if somebody says, well, are you really, can you handle chemo and you had whatever, it's not, you're not committing to chemo when you get a biopsy. And now so many companies are even willing to, you know, biopsy. If you're told at your, you know, community center, oh, the insurance might not cover this, you'll get a bill for 1200 They have, all the companies have like a dedicated team to help you with and hopefully, you know, offload the burden of finances or even cover it, especially when it's diagnostic. So if you need this, if your doctor is resistant to doing sequencing or molecular for your stage four tumor, I would say, well, no, well, I'll take my risk. And then you ask for that patient number and you can actually get assistance in that setting, uh, even with the blood if, if, if a biopsy is inaccessible. Because if you're making a life for the uh, decision for the end of life, like at least knowing what we know with some things that are very sensitive, platinum therapy in small cell is the only one where you say if your performance status is three, where it means you stay over That's half so the funny. time sitting down or laying down throughout the day, it is still recommended to get it because you get such a dramatic improvement 85% of the time with your with your treatment and death and, and debility is so quick if you don't. So, you know, I hope that's a pearl that people take away. Rohit, I know you have more to share on that. And I think that's important because uh, the education aspect, as you said, Sanjay and Rahul, that first we used to go out for a consult with hospitalist or primary care physician who used to direct these patients. And the consult was like, Doc, I already talked to them about hospice because the scans aren't looking good. Well, that's not the case anymore. Again, there are much more treatment options available. Now that's one. The other aspect is the multidisciplinary rounds as well. How fast this field is changing where now we are offering much more neoadjuvant chemotherapies in advance or I'll combine that with targeted and uh, immunotherapy where surgeons can certainly intervene but after the therapy has been given while that was not the case before. It, However, some surgeons or some radonks are already jumping on this. But again, that all involves education, education, education from all aspects. And the key focus here is multidisciplinary rounds. That is such a big point. Another way, you know, patients can kind of take that empowerment themselves is, is to ask the question. I'm so glad you said that, Rohit. Is if you have a stage two or stage three, especially like with breast cancer, certain types, like that matters if it's hormone positive or triple negative or hormone positive or you know kidney or bladder um, there's so many tumor types where you need to ask the question is there any room or relevance to seeing a medical oncologist first for possible treatment before getting it out and i know somebody may be listening to this and say why would i why would i leave the cancer in if it's curable get it out as soon as you can the reason is is because we have a ton of data that shows as the stages go up the chances that there is something hanging around somewhere that we cannot see, forget with the naked eye, it takes about 200 million cells to see it on average CT scan. So if there's, you know, a million, 10 million, 500,000, 50,000, 
that shows or declares itself usually in that year to two years that, that oh you had a recurrence it was actually a persistence more likely than not that we just couldn't see it's called micrometastatic so what people started doing is they started taking a whole bunch of studies and say hey we know triple negative comes back a lot in stage three or HER2 positive oh in HER2 positive in breast cancer we know we got a lot of treatments that work very well what if we did it before to take care of the disease we can't see do people live longer and if the data shows you have a better chance of success with surgery to get treatment up front if 100% of people did it. More people will live to get treatment up front than to do the surgery up front. Now, of course, there's unique situations. That's when we recommend new adjuvant. And the same question is on the, on, the, on the back end, which is, you know, now we have adjuvant, which means reduce your chance of a recurrence after that definitive measure was taken. In renal cell and bladder, a lot of, you know, I can't expect every community or urologist to know, oh, this data came out you know, within the last year to all of a sudden do immune therapy after you know, renal cell or bladder or whatever it is. But you need to ask the question, is there any data or value in seeing a medical oncologist? Or just Google it. You know, when is, is adjuvant therapy you know, in genital urinary cancers recommended? The answer is yes, and it wasn't forever. We used to use you know, this TKI, tyrosine kinase inhibitor, that none of us really wanted to use because the data wasn't strong, and now all of a sudden we have data. So those are very good points, Rohit, that I'm glad you brought up. Yeah, no, same thing. I think that field is moving so fast. We just saw a study on NEJM by Dr. Patel in melanoma. We were giving adjuvant immunotherapy, did great. But just part of that treatment was given before surgery. Patients went through surgery and whatever was left over was given thereafter. This is all immunotherapy. Patients did better. So again, it's going to help the surgeon if we select the right patients to give treatment upfront. Can it shrink the disease so that your surgery outcomes are better? And then, of course, quality of life and are they living longer? So I said, I think this field's moving so fast and it's exciting. It is. Is there anything else you both want to share? A little nuggets or pearls? Do y'all have any knowledge on nutrition and health? I will say like, that's one thing that Medongs, at least me, like I want to learn and do so much more because oncology now, because we keep saying people live longer, people live longer, it needs to be more holistic. Like it can't just be intervention of surgery, radiation treatments, because now it all has to do with how do I, you, Sanjay, you talked about, you know, palliative and therapeutic or palliative and adjunctive care. Well, what about the nutritional aspect? Is there things that make me the chance of recurrence, you know, less? And the answer, and I've had a few very, you know, talented and, and well-read experts on this podcast. The answer is we are just starting to learn and find out. Like there's a lot of stuff that have been posited or theorized, but, but when we do the data, we're like, what, you know what? This divine creation that is the human race and the gut and everything is actually more complicated than we realize in immune therapy. <laughs> and that's the whole purpose of, of evidence-based recommendations. So anyone hearing this, there's so many things in med school that I, in residency, I'd be like, what do you mean evidence-based? Of course, and then I'd be like, but at the same time I'd say, well, why don't we do this? It doesn't make sense. It makes sense within the own humility of our understanding at this point in the world. And there's been so many things we've been wrong about. And the evidence means, Take the human that's divinely created or celestially or whatever you believe. See if that thing that we theorize and our humility is as you know, mortal beings and human minds, does it make a difference or it will work? And that's what evidence comes from. And that's where also trials come from to give the evidence. But a lot of that is in nutrition. Even probiotics is, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things, right? You know, what causes cancer? We know alcohol does. Do I, do, am I totally abstinent? No, because like this whole like mental health balance, you know, philosophy that I was grown up with, mostly Eastern Indian. But, um, but, but it definitely does, right? And, and, and overweightness and truncal obesity, which I would argue Indians, at least on my father's side, Punjabi side, has like, you know, it matters where your fat distribution is, it seems like. And, and, and in my family, a lot of it is truncal or around the belly, and that's actually worse. So there are a couple of things that, that we know cause it, smoking, obviously. But short of that, you know, a lot of the stuff is still, you know, to be, to be learned. Right, I can't stress the importance of um, nutritional exercise and all this supportive management that comes along. And I feel like they're all the university or hospital settings have this available. I think patients should ask for it. Sometimes the oncologist or the medical team is not even aware of what's available to them. Other important thing is I feel like the cancer, the treatments, and in general, everything causes fatigue. Now, the best way to fight that is by staying active, by eating healthy. So again, can't stress the most important aspect of it is that countless number of studies have shown that if you stay active, if you eat healthy, you're going to have better survival. You're going to tolerate the uh, systemic therapy much better than just an uh, average person. So 
very, very important. Yeah, and we're just learning, like, the whole idea of gut microbiota with immunotherapy, how that's changing the flora and everything. So I think one thing that we lack in our residency or medical school, we don't get much exposure to nutrition. Yeah, we talk about it just on the fly, but there's no dedicated, like, rotations for that. I did not go through it. A lot of it was just learning on your rounds, but I really think that we should also take some onus. Yes, we need to educate our patients, but also try to keep up with all that's changing now. Where can people find you to be able to like, you know, learn and, and kind of learn as you learn, uh, as, as we've kind of all, you know, conceptualized today. Uh, I know Twitter and is there anywhere else and what, what are y'all's handles? Yeah, so uh, on Twitter, we're Onk Brothers. We also have a website, onkbrothers.com. Again, I am in Rochester, New York with Beaumont Cancer Institute and Rohit's with UPMC in Jamestown, New York. So yeah, like uh, we have uh, some, some similar coverage out on YouTube as well as a podcast, which is available as well. And again, I, would, I just can't end on a note that please, please, please ask your doctor questions. If there is any time that you would like to seek out a second opinion, please reach out for that. At the end of the day, what matters is patient and your family's care. So that's extremely important. <laughs>